Okay, so I would like to welcome everyone to this speaker series e event. Um, we are very honored to have our guest speaker, Margaret Leahy, um, joining us here. Um, now, and I'm sure that there's plenty of people here then that know Margaret, but I would just like to share some of Margaret's bio uh, then just for the people that don't know Margaret anyway. So um, we are delighted and honoured to welcome our guest speaker, Margaret Leahy, who has been a clinician re re researcher lecturer at Trinity College Dublin with over 30 years experience in the area of research and education. In more than 30 years of working as a clinical researcher, witnessing changes in our understanding and practice and education of stuttering. So Margaret would be taking a personal perspective on what's been meaningful to her over this time. Um, Margaret um, so, and her, her research and publications covered the subject of education of student clean, clean, clean missions and working with people who who's this, 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 this fluency is a concern. Thank you, Stephen. Cool. Okay, Margaret, I'm uh, going to pass it over on to you now. Great, great. Thank you. Thank you. I think it's my honor to be here, and uh, I'm, I'm really very uh, pleased to be able to be here and to, to chat to you all. Um, since we're talking about talking, I would really like it to be interactive, and I would really like, hopefully, to hear your comments as we go along, uh, or well, perhaps not as we go along, maybe maybe towards the end. It just might be easier to stick with that format. Um, so what I'm going to do is have a personal look back and uh, at the very end, maybe a few moments to look forward. Um, uh, I've been, I've been uh, revising this presentation in my head over and over since Stephen asked me to to uh to, to talk and uh let's see how we go anyway so uh first slide yeah okay i wanted to talk about the next slide sorry the, ne the next one coming up i want to talk about this ancient irish law something that we have in our heritage i have written about it somewhat uh, but it's one of the most important uh, aspects, I think, of our, our history uh, in terms of, of acceptance of stuttering and the whole way of looking at managing it. And it comes from the 12th century, uh, from the Book of Leinster. That's one of the ancient manuscripts in Trinity College. Uh, I was directed to it by the um, scholar Fergus Kelly who is from the Dublin Institute of Advanced Studies, or he worked there for many years. And he uh, examined the various laws uh, of, uh, um, of, of this time, the Brehan laws, and has written about them. Uh, but he didn't actually write much about, about this particular law, which is uh, translated as stuttering is entitled to time. It's to me a very big statement of the acceptance of stuttering uh, while facilitating the person who stuttered and giving them extra time when needed to make their case in court of law or in a situation where they had, it, where they had to present some materials or where they were uh, talking to give them extra time. And that facilitatory aspect is very much part of the management, if you like, um, the social kind of management of the impact of stuttering. Uh, where there's less time, people may stutter more, but where there's more time, they feel that, you know, that they can get on with it and, and, uh, and continue to stutter, but also uh, be accepted from the point of view of actually having a law protecting them. It's, it's huge in one sense 
that that uh, th that the society um, came up with this particular uh, uh, piece of legislation, and you know it's dating back to a period before our neighbours um, took over some of our work here. Um, but it's it's still, I think, uh, an inspiration to consider um, dealing with the impact. Along the same lines uh, from the uh, annals of Ulster, there was a, a, a king who was called Cushcraj Mend Macha. So Cushcraj or Cushcred uh, was the son of um, uh, Conor MacNessa, the King of Ulster, and he had a significant stutter. Now, this is described in the Annals of Ulster, how he, how he became a stutterer, uh, but he was a hero and he was described as being extremely eloquent when he spoke, even with his stutter. The mend there uh, in, old, in old Irish um, um, says stutterer. Uh, so he was elected King of Ulster um, uh, after Conor MacNessa died. Uh, so it, 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 he was, although he was a prince, he was not actually, um, uh, what's the word, entitled to be king. He had to be elected. So again, it looks at the acceptance of stuttering, not as a problem as such, but something that was uh, in fact described as, as eloquent. Next slide, please. So I'm just addressing some very general issues here, and I really would like your opinion on them, and I'd like you to come back and tell me what you think about this. But looking back at what, what a therapy is, what speech therapy is to me, uh, it, it's, it's a mixture of, uh, of art and science. Uh, it, also, it also has this whole notion, it opens up with, with uh, with an exploration of what's going on, what seems to be the problem. I used to think of it in terms of problems solving, but I no longer think that. I think we're talking about problem management overall. And um, so what I believe we should do that we don't do when we're building up the relationship early on in therapy, I think we should spend some time uh, explaining to people who come to therapy about what we believe therapy is about. I think we should be able to explain that in, in, in terms that can be easily understood and what we, what we consider are components of therapy. When I was looking at this many years ago, I, I wrote a paper on um, epistemology, uh, the theory of knowledge, thinking I knew something about it. I really don't know very much about it, but I entitled the paper, Art, Science and Magic, or Rigor, Relevance and Relationship, or Faith, Hope and Charity. And when I looked at those subheadings, I thought, well, what's, what are the OR, ORs doing between them? Because in fact, there is a little bit of everything in what we do. There's art, there's science, there's a touch of magic that is brought from the relationship that is brought from from people who come to therapy uh, and it's, uh, I think that that emerges from the, the, the interaction that goes on. Uh, we certainly rely on science, we rely on the rigor of science to inform us about what's appropriate, what, what can be uh, what can be proven if you like, what can be uh, subjected to uh, looking at evidence overall. Um, we need to do stuff that is relevant. There's no point in saying we're, we're scientists here, we know something about speech. Uh, there's a lot about speech that we don't know, but there's a considerable amount of speech that we do know about, but we have to make it relevant to the particular people who are coming to, to look for some help. Ultimately, I believe that the relationship or that uh, aspect of interaction that goes on between a therapist and a client, or uh, no matter what the problem is, that that relationship 
is a listening relationship, hopefully, and that it is the basis of change in therapy. It comes about from having a, a supportive relationship that's going to move in the direction of positive change. Uh, the third part then is faith, hope and charity that I consider uh, not in the religious sense at all, but we do have faith in what we're doing. We certainly are optimistic about it and uh, we should be able to explain this, why we have this optimism, why we feel we know what we're doing is appropriate and looking at the evidence that's there. And then charity, a part of the relationship is yeah, a, a kind of love, a kind of respect that's based on, on this notion of we can work together. Now, it's a professional relationship, so we're not talking about anything but a friendly relationship here, but it is very much, I, I believe, part of what we do. So we have meaningful exchanges during the exploration. And I believe that, it, that the exchange is important. We generally don't tell anybody about what we believe therapy is. We generally don't. We may not even tell ourselves. And it really is something that we need to, 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 to look at and say, well, this is why I am a therapist and this is how I believe we'd make some effort to facilitate problem management. And so coming on then, I think the, the, the major part of, of therapeutic effect is change. There should be positive change. There really should not be negative change, but every so often there may be negative change, but we need to look at it and develop it and change it into positive change and we do that together that cannot be done by the therapist alone that has to has to be done with the with the two people working together uh, so there's commitment there and there has to be commitment there for change to happen a commitment on the part of the therapist but also commitment on the part of the client uh, so overall i think what therapy is about uh, is about communication not speech not just speech, speech is a big part of it uh, because speech incorporates language, even though we divide it up, but that's another, that's in the next slide, hang in there. Uh, so we're talking about communication, we're talking about competence overall, we're talking about confidence, and I believe that confidence is absolutely essential if we're going to progress towards desirable change. So confidence, which would incorporate resilience, is, is, I think, probably the highlight of what we do. But we're not doing it just with speech. We're not doing it just with language. We're doing it with communication generally, which is a bigger, a bigger concept. OK, next slide, please. So speech. Yep. Uh, well, for years we were called speech therapists, and then we changed the name to speech and language therapists, although we do know that speech incorporates language, but we divided it up. Um, we divided it up for, for a number of reasons, but I really do think we don't have the right term for what we do at all. I don't believe that speech therapy is. Is, is the right term. We haven't got it yet. Speech language pathology is not the right term either. But anyway, that's what, that's what we focus on. So we're looking at speech uh, and its complexity, and we're looking at what we do know about it, what we don't know about it. For example, we don't know about spontaneity. We don't know about everything about automaticity. We don't know uh, quite a bit about how the whole thing happens so smoothly for the vast majority of people. Uh, and because it happens so smoothly for the vast majority of people, um, I think it's not, uh, it's taken for granted to some extent that everybody knows a little bit about what speech is. Anyway, overall, 
uh, we're looking at uh, a quotation here from Walsh or aspects of the quotation from Walsh et al, who look at the complexity of fluent speech in this instance. And they say it's seemingly effortless, but it is a remarkably complex process involving the functional synergy of multiple neural networks. It also involves language formulation. Speech is not anything without language. It involves articulatory planning, which is similar to phonetics and how we, um, how we achieve that with what we normally use for uh, eating and tasting and various other kinds of things and the functions of the mouth and the area around about the throat and the um, uh, respiratory uh, organs. Motor execution, which is a large part of why we look at speech on its own because it's the motor that drives it and auditory integration very important auditory processing and auditory integration. And then we also have somatosensory integration. So, uh, so all of these aspects are studied by the uh, student therapist. Um, although some are not studied in as much detail perhaps as should be, but enough to give them a good understanding about how that synergy goes together in order to produce a fluent speech. Next, please. Thanks. So the process begins, uh, the process for speech production begins in, in, in childhood rapidly and systematically and continues throughout life. It's directly influenced by biological, linguistic, sociological factors, opportunities for interaction, cognitive and emotional processing, and I would add, it's influenced directly by education, it's influenced directly by lifelong learning. And there are several other factors, if you can think about what may go in there, that's going to influence speech production overall. Okay, next slide. So when we're talking about change, when we're talking about therapy, we're necessarily talking about um, the whole idea of facilitating change. So the therapist facilitates change uh, that is desired by the client. What does the client feel is important for them enough, important enough for them to come to therapy, to look for some help in managing what they're doing or not doing the way that they would like to be doing it. So the goals then have to do with that whole idea of what the therapist or what the client feels is, is, the, is the desirable change. And as a therapist over the years, I would have to say that particularly when I'm working with clients who stutter, that two major influences in my life would be George Kelly from personal constructivist psychology and Van Riper, Charles Van Riper, or Chuck Van Riper, uh, who is a therapist who looked at um, and has produced some extraordinary, well, for me, the, the Bibles of, uh, of stuttering work, the nature of stuttering and the treatment of stuttering in the 1970s and second editions in the 1980s. Um, essentially, what both of them look at is experimentation, looking at behavior as an experiment. We behave the way we do because it has worked for us before. It's an experiment. We try something out and hey, it seems to work. And one of the reasons why a person stutters according to Fay Francella, who's a constructivist therapist, um, not a speech and language therapist, a psycho psychological therapist, although I believe she had started life as a, a professional life as um, an occupational therapist. In any event, the, the notion was that people stutter because it's in that way that they can anticipate the reactions that they're likely to get. They experiment 
with the stutter and the stutter gives them a certain kind of reaction, even though it's not necessarily a positive experience. They know how people will react when they stutter. They don't necessarily know how they will react if they don't stutter or if they're fluent. So that's one of that reasons about uh, of looking at experimentation kind of on, a, on, a, on an open basis. It's also about reconstruing. We have to have psychological change for any change to happen. So change in any behavior has to have some psychological input. And it's that idea that, that reconstruing will open up the possibility for a new vision of what's going on. We have some very wonderful examples of this kind of thing um, in stuttering, where people um, use the river analogy and that notion of not being able to stand in the same place in the river. Well, you stand in the same place in the river, but it's a different river all of the time because the river is flowing all of the time and, and it can't remain the same. So the, the, the river analogy is also used by Jer, 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 Jerome Ellis in his music uh, and in his uh, poetry. Uh, very, very beautiful work by Jer, 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 Jerome. And uh, it's that whole idea um, of having a spiritual dimension going on in experiencing is stuttering. Um, he talks about talking like a river, that you know, the obstacles in the river are the are the blocks, and he has to get around them somehow. And his river voice does that, but he has some beautiful music as well on the saxophone that that works well to <coughs> sorry to demonstrate some of that river analogy. Excuse me. With a beautiful book for children by um, Jordan Scott, I Talk Like a River, which starts out with, I wake up every morning with a lot of words going in my head, going around in my head, and I can't say all of them. And then he talks forward on how talking like a river is a means for him to be able to come to terms with his stutter and also being able to manage it better and have the confidence to accept himself with the stutter and get on with life. Another beautiful book for children is by Peter Schneider, is um, uh, the, the title of which is Who, 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 says Who, 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 and looks at a number of animals that uh, have different ways of expressing themselves, but each of them has some kind of a problem or some atypical way of communication. Uh, overall, when we're looking about change, we're looking about the kinds of changes that are going to be meaningful for the person and the ones that are currently uh, used quite extensively now in therapy um, are, are from CBT, where thinking, feeling and behaviour are the three main aspects of change. So the easiest and the most accessible ways of beginning this uh, positive change is to change thinking. So that's the reconstruing aspect, if you like, uh, and that with a change in thinking, a change in feeling comes around and feeling and emotions then are um, governed to some extent by how we think and then ultimately behavior changes as a result. So back to the CCC, communication, confidence, competence. If we're looking at developing confidence, we do it starting to think about what if I were confident, what would I say here? That's the experiment. That's the experimental question. And then what if, Try to understand what it would, or visual, what, visualize what it would be like to be confident in that situation. How would I look? How would I begin to express myself? And we do that without talking. What is it that's going to say that I'm more confident here? Perhaps smiling or perhaps looking directly at somebody.
and then moving on from there and working through. So experimentation using the what if. Okay, next slide, please, Stephen. Why does change not happen? So uh, Stephen's already spoken a little bit about identity. Uh, it's a very important part of change. Um, again, coming back to Francella, uh, she, she looked at this idea that if, if, you, if you identify yourself as a stutterer mainly, that that, 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 that identity is going to be more difficult to change than, for example, if you identify yourself as someone who stutters sometimes, or someone who is fluent sometimes, or whatever else, but uh, opening it up a little bit and not having the, the single identity business going on there. The, the idea as well that's going on here is that attitudes are very hard to change. And one of the big attitudes that a person will have uh, who stutters, that a person who stutters often has, is the is the attitude that is expressed in the stutterer stereotype. It's huge, it's very strong, and it is subject to small changes have happened. I can report confidently that teachers in Ireland are more open about the stutterer stereotype now than they were 20 years ago. So this is a wonderful change wonderful change and it needs to change more around society but it's a good a good way a good way of getting across the point the acceptance of stuttering or the acceptance of any difference um, is 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 uh, going to reduce the stereotype that's there and uh, with this stereotype some very recent work um, by uh, very excellent work I should say but it's also recent um, by Boyle, uh, looks at self-stigma. And that's the idea that the stereotype that's there marks us, marks the person who stutters uh, as, as a stutterer, as, as different, uh, different as, as not being as intelligent and not being as um, open, not being as... Uh, well, you, you know more about the stereotype than I, I don't need to explain it anymore. But anyways, that whole idea that the person often begins to think similar to what the stigma is. They begin to see themselves as, well, yeah, well, actually, I'm not that smart anyway. And actually, yeah, I don't like to, to be extrovert. And yeah, I am nervous sometimes and I'm nervous when I'm speaking and so on. So, yes, I, I have the stigma. And that really is something that we need to, to dissolve completely and that we need to be able to, again, focus on achieving uh, a sense of confidence that's going to be resilient in dealing with the stereotype when it appears, but also in dealing with the self-stigma that's there. So change doesn't happen where where there is lack of meaningfulness in what the person is trying to change so for example in learning a technique speech technique now i know from my work in using speech techniques over the years that in fact techniques do work they do work but they don't work for everybody and they don't work all of the time but they can improve fluency if that's what the person wants to experiment with. But part of the idea is that it's not always meaningful for the person who stutters to change their stuttering to become more fluent. It's not always meaningful. They like themselves as they stutter. They like the stuttering. They like the sound of it. They appreciate themselves in that kind of identity. Therefore, it's not. If it's not meaningful, well, change isn't going to happen. So um, I think this notion of difference and diversity and opening up uh, that's happening in society all over um, is a very strong way of uh, recognizing 
that change doesn't have to happen if the person is accepted, if the difference and the diversity is accepted. Why change if they're accepted and if they're recognized for their strengths, for their ways of working, for their abilities rather than their disabilities? And in that instance, why change? And if that why change is there, change isn't going to happen. That personal change isn't going to happen because we can celebrate then the person with the difference and with that notion of diversity is good. No question but that diversity is good. Next slide, please. So we do know what stuttering is about. And from uh, 2008, which is some time ago, 12, 13, 14, 15 years ago, uh, Kate Watkins uh, et al. in London uh, were able to express it very clearly what happens when stuttering happens. And with that there was overactivity in parts of the brain and the anterior insula in the cerebellum in the midbrain and underactivity in other parts, ventral premotor, Rolanda operculum, sensory motor cortex and Herschel's gyrus. And there was additional overactivity and underactivity when the person stuttered. That was quite different to when fluent speakers stuttered. Now, clearly all of these um, neurological aspects do give us a good deal of information about what's actually going on, but they are all directly influenced by genetics, by epigenetics, or that whole idea of what's going on in the environment, by linguistic functioning, and by temperament functioning. Now we do know that, and we've known that for quite a while. So when somebody says we don't know the cause of stuttering, we don't know exactly what's going on when person stutters, well actually we do. We may not fully understand it, but we do know what's going on. And in, in that instance, we should be able to express it very clearly. I think, the neurological aspects are less important overall because in fact, we don't need to understand all of that to be able to specify very clearly who we are and how we are in communication, in interaction. So, um, okay, there's a lot there and there's a lot for everybody else to have some interaction about. There's a lot going on there. And we can discuss that as we go through. So next slide, please, Steve. How are we doing here? Yeah. So what do we need to know about the nature of stuttering? Well, we need to now know and we need to understand that fluency and disfluency are a continuum. It's not one either or. There's no such thing as complete fluency. Oh, well, there are some people who are more fluent than others. But at some stage, they will also use disfluencies. We're talking about the aspects of continuity or flow of speech and interaction in a person's first language. So speech and interaction. We do know that disfluency occurs naturally in speech utterances. We do know also that fluency occurs naturally in stuttered or utterances or in some stuttering speech. This disfluency has its function, very clear functions in communication overall. Uh, for example, to designate emphasis or uncertainty. And uh, there are degrees of smoothness, ease, disconnectedness, naturalness, regularity, and rhythm when we talk about the continuum. So we have spent some time over the years looking at differentiating fluency from disfluency, or whereas in fact, it's an artificial kind of um, division because disfluency is there all the time. So when someone stutters, they're doing it more when someone is considered to be fluent, they're doing it less, but the disfluency that's there is still a function, it functions. In stuttering, it functions differently 
to the way it stutters, it functions in, for example, in literature. So I think looking at it as a continuum is uh, opening up that possibility of being able to see that we all are disfluent at times and stutters, stutterers are also fluent at times. It's a continuum. Next slide, please. Okay, these are parts of a definition. Okay, so fluency, disfluency, occasional or variable, involuntary breaks or interruption. They can be involuntary, they don't have to be involuntary. We can use S, things like M, 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 or various other kinds of interjections that are indeed voluntary and serve a function. So the transitions or connectedness may be interrupted and will occur at phoneme, syllable, word, and phrase utterances. So influences on the quality of the continuum include speech rate. And we need to know, perhaps, and we do know, that the average rate is around 140 syllables per minute for people who do not stutter. And it may be considerably less for people who do, who do stutter. But it's not, it's not um, what's important about understanding here uh, in terms of rate is that slowing the rate is one of the major techniques for changing disfluency. So we have interjections, hesitations, repetitions, and various difference, uh, differences in intonation going on there. All function in our communication as integral to our capacities in speech production or in communicating overall. Okay, so rapidly. No, what have I got there? System. Oh yeah, it begins in childhood and it, it, it continues throughout life. Okay, so I'm almost finished now. I think the next one is the last slide. Um, yeah, so looking forward, I think, uh, I think that, well, having said confidence is, is very important. I think as well, acceptance is is one of the big things that we need to to look at um, that would include self-acceptance and the confidence to be oneself and that whole idea of um, society acceptance so in other words smashing the stereotype and smashing the stigma getting rid of it reducing it letting it go wherever it came from and then that whole notion of facilitating openness and expression of the stutter. And this is one of the things that is now taught to children who stutter, uh, who attend the camp, the Dream Speak Live. That whole idea that they can stand up and say, and my name is Margaret and I happen to stutter sometimes, uh, but I'm much better at doing X, Y, and Z than you are. And I can do whatever I want in terms of using whatever. And so on and so forth. So having confidence to be open about oneself, to accept what's going on, that's a bit different, but hey, it's only atypical because you think it's atypical. I don't think it's atypical. I think it's okay. And back again then to the uh, ancient law that is in our heritage, or at least in the Irish heritage, and that whole idea of accepting that stuttering is entitled to time and that this can facilitate the whole business of working in the area of speaking and in interaction and going from there then with confidence. That's it for the moment. So let's, let's look at some kind of interaction or anything you'd like to say about any of those points or anything you'd like to question. You know, Margaret, yes. thanks a lot. Um, that was a great talk there. Uh, so I'd just like to open it up to the then just to the floor now. So if anyone has any ob observations or questions, or anything. sure. Ma Margaret, you, you have very briefly mentioned that um, um, slowing this uh, um, speech rate is one of the the 
um, better, I suppose, um, and uh, techniques um, as regards um, attaining more f f fluency could, could, um, could, could you say a little more about that? Sure. Uh, I worked in this area, uh, Jeff, for, for many years, um, uh, certainly in the 70s and 80s. Uh, we taught techniques and there's no question but that slowing the rate was one of the more powerful techniques. Um, so when, when it is um, used uh, systematically and particularly in uh, an intensive kind of situation where the person learns over and over and over and over how to slow down, how to, how to manage the disfluency through that slower rate, um, it does actually work. I mean, I've, I've, I have experience of clients who, who were who achieved a certain kind of fluency uh, through, through that slower rate or by learning to slow down some aspects of the beginning of their speaking and so on. Um, I would not adhere to it anymore. I, I, uh, it's there, it's very useful. Um, what we would have done back then is start at an extremely slow rate and perhaps perhaps something like five syllables in a breath, so that it sounded a bit like this. And then over time, that would speed up to 10 syllables in a breath and maybe a little bit more. And then going from there. So it, it, was, it was regulated uh, up to 140 syllables, which is the average rate. Now, some people did not like it at all. And some people felt that if they were going to speak that slowly, that people would just not listen to them. And other people thought, well, OK, it's artificial. It's not me. And so um, it's not at a certain point when people came to me and asked for techniques. And I said, no, you can learn those techniques yourself. You can go online. You can get various models online. You can look at what's there and develop them for yourself. There are, there are in fact, programs up there. Well, everything's, everything's up there. <laughs> everything's there. If you keep looking, you'll find. That's all up yeah. there. Google, yeah. well, Google has really demonstrated an awful lot of stuff that's up there. But anyway, mm. so the point is, yeah. Is that enough information or? It is. Thanks. Would you say that um, slowing slightly in terms of not, not rushing and not um, trying to, to, to get out the, the word as quickly as possible in case a block comes kind of thing? Do you think that that is advisable? Well, it really is up to you. If you if it's meaningful for you, I would say yes, absolutely. Yeah. If yeah. it's meaningful for you, but it's also yeah. as meaningful to say I do stutter sometimes, and you know, um, but I am slowing down a bit so as I'm not stuttering as much or whatever, you know. But yeah. Uh, yeah. that expression, it's an interesting one, um, but it is very uh, well documented. Also, is that if you can be confident in your in your stutter, that it, in effect, it does reduce over time because you're losing the stereotype. You're losing that notion that that person's going to think of me as incompetent. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, and and in that sense, you can you can stutter, but yeah, it's it's entirely as far as I'm concerned, it's entirely up to the person. Certainly. Certainly, uh, slowing the rate is, is a very powerful means of increasing fluency, um, if that's what you want to do. In general, in general now, the, the, um, the situation is not to teach techniques, mm -hmm. but to look at confidence, resilience, ability, and so on. Sure, yeah. Okay. Thank you for that. Yeah. Pleasure. Thank you. Margaret, um, um, can I just ask you about your passion for stuttering and why? Uh, what is it about 
stuttering that may do like kind of feel dispassionate uh, about walking in at risk. When I when I uh, when I was a child, apparently I stuttered, and my dad thought it was the funniest thing in the world. He used to tell jokes about about how I stuttered. Uh, I don't remember any of that. Um, when I was uh, when I was uh, seventeen, I was in a road traffic accident, and I apparently started to stutter afterwards. And my mother brought me to a psychiatrist, and the psychiatrist said it was affectation, nothing more than affectation. He was just dismissed it. <clears throat> I didn't. Again, I didn't have any. What what's the word? Um, negative effects. I, you know, but when I mentioned it to some of my friends more recently, because I was asked about it recently, and I mentioned it as well, yeah, you were always a bit stuttery, but I mean, eh, so what? <laughs> so it didn't actually mean a lot. Uh, when I became a, a therapist, um, uh, I wanted actually to work in aphasia, but I was told to work in stuttering, and it was handed to me. Nobody wanted to do stuttering, you see. <laughs> so they handed it to me. They thought we'll give it there to her and we'll see what happens. Um, so I, I had no problem taking it on because I would have taken on anything, but I wanted to work in aphasia. Mm -hmm. And then at a later stage, I wanted to work in voice. But anyway, um, once, once I started working with clients and once I started working with students, there were always some students who loved the area of stuttering and who became therapists because of stuttering. Mm -hmm. But uh, the majority tended not to get into it too much. They just didn't want to get into it. And that's partly, I think, because of the um, ideas around about um, psychology, that they didn't have enough uh, um, expertise in uh, working through aspects of psychology that led to change. I, I believe that's what it may have been. But there was always a few in every class who wanted to work in stuttering. And hopefully some of them are in the audience. Uh, tonight and um, Mary O'Dwyer may be there and some others but anyway um okay yeah. so passion passionate passion gosh I I you know there's I don't know <laughs> it's the short answer there's a longer answer but I don't I don't know, but I um, it, it's an area that is uh, that is so full of um, research. It's so full of activity. There's a lot going on in it. There's a lot to understand. And yes, I uh, I, I love it. I love it. Yeah. Brilliant. Brilliant, Margaret. Thanks. Um, can I just go to Vilm next and then we will go to Nora then after. Then. OK, Vilm. Thank you, Margaret, for such a great talk. Um, so I just wanted to sort of um, ask you, and I know Mary's on this call as well, and I have read stuff about narrative therapy, and, I, and I've contacted you way, way, way in the past about narrative therapy with um, the counselling approach with adults and also with kids. Um, yeah, I, I was just wondering whether you could share a bit more about how you see narrative therapy um, moving forward as well and how the stories we tell ourselves and the stories that other people hear about um, ourselves with stammering and stuttering can be reflected back and change how we see ourselves. Okay, I think narrative therapy is very powerful. Uh, I think the whole business of telling stories, I didn't mention it in the exploration, but I meant to really, you know, say that when we're, when we're looking at what's going on, uh, it's time for stories, actually. Tell me some stories about your stuttering. Tell me some stories about yourself when you were at school and tell me some stories and whether stuttering comes into them or not, but you know, tell me about it. And um, instead we tend to ask more direct questions. So I think it's story time rather than question time. Uh, but working from there, uh, I think the whole area of being able to um, separate the problem from the person is a great start to objectify the, uh, the problem. And it puts it out there. So, so you can talk about the stutter in the third person, give it a name and work through that whole business of, um, of realizing uh, the stutter is the problem. It's not the, I'm not, I'm not the problem. It's the stutter that's the problem and 
give it a name and so on. Uh, I think moving from there, uh, certainly the way Mary and Fiona have worked with it and documented it. Um, I, I, think, I think really if Mary is there, maybe she'd be able to talk further about it. Uh, I, um, I believe that there's a great potential for the person to rewrite their stories, reauthor their whole stories in working with people who have, um, who have experienced problems in stuttering and um, to be able to, again, develop that confidence that's part of the whole business of, of reauthoring who they are. Uh, Mary, if she's there, maybe would say more, or Fiona? Uh, I'm here, Margaret. Um, thank you very much. That was a great talk. Um, yeah, I just think that I suppose what narrative therapy does is, um, I, I, I think the lovely thing about it is that it doesn't, even though we talk about the problem narrative, um, it doesn't necessarily mean that stuttering is a problem. It more is like why it's, how it's a problem, how somebody experiences any aspects of their living as problematic and mm -hmm. then how that can be reauthored. And um, so I think it does fit very well with all kinds of neuroaffirmative practice, which I think is the way we're going at the moment. Mm -hmm. And also I think the thing about narrative therapy is that it, <clears throat> our narrative practice mm -hmm. is, it really does help the person who stutters um, to explore how their stuttering is not separate to who they are. So the rest of their narratives, like if life's been um, difficult in other ways, or if they're a particular kind of, um, if they experience people in a certain way, maybe they're, very, they're quite a sensitive soul or they're, um, they find uh, all kinds of interaction difficult or um, mm. they're very determined, very successful people, all that kind of different kinds of aspects of their story that's not stuttering per se does interact with their stories about stuttering. Yeah. Uh, that's a really good strength about it because it really allows holistic, um, Margaret talks a lot about meaning making. So it really allows that meaning making um, to happen at a level that's integrated for the person. It's not like my stuttering is over here and I'm here. because I, I, And that is part of narrative practice is to, is to get that separation so that you can, you know, um, see, um, take a position and, and and not no longer see yourself as being um powerless in the whole situation you can take a position and you can decide where you want to go but i i, I so that, that that's not to contradict that is what i'm saying that the holistic bit um just allows you to kind of integrate um reauthoring your stuttering story with the rest of your story yeah stories and thank identity you, and mary thank you yeah Thanks, Mary. Sorry, uh, if we could go to Nora next there, I think Nora has a question as well. Thanks very much, Stephen. Um, and thanks, Margaret, for that uh, lovely talk. I've been kind of coming in in and out with our little six-month-old, hence the video coming, okay, going okay. on and off. <laughs> right, um, okay. Congratulations. On your six thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> um, um, I suppose coming back to your your question, Margaret, about all the different C's, uh, words beginning with C to do with therapy um, or speech therapy. And I would agree that I don't think that we've qu quite found the right term for it. Um, I was glad to hear you say the, the C word celebration and that there is space for celeb celeb celebration of of um, stammering in this in uh, in in speech therapy as well, and I suppose I'm wondering where the C where context is because I think what I have struggled with as a person who stammers is, um um I, 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 I can be as confident as I can be, and yet I still m m meet negative reactions 
sure. um, out there in the big bad world. And I suppose how how to make sense of that is, I think, um, perhaps an important role for speech therapy to play. And so I suppose the C word that I put on that was context. And so I was just interested in your thoughts on that in terms of the things that we can't control as individuals the thing that the things that come at us from society how do you manage it at the moment uh depends on the day <laughs> <laughs> depend right. depend depends on the mood <laughs> all right okay sure sure yes i think it's important that it's um certainly recognized uh but the, the fact is that negative reactions are the other person's problem in that in that way. But but yeah, they're coming at you. So it really comes down to your your confidence in being able to say, well, you're carrying a burden that I don't need to carry, you know, and I don't have the problem that you have about it. I don't know. I mean, that's a kind of resilience that comes in that kind of thing. I I honestly don't know. What's the best way? Are you talking about managing it? Are you talking about, you know, that that you're still going to get negative reactions? Uh, I, suppose I'm, I, I suppose the... I'm. I suppose I'm wondering where that's where the space for that is in therapy, um, uh, and and whether that has kind of changed over over the years. I think for a long time I thought of. Um, my stammer as my problem to solve and my burden to carry and in more recent years I think I've become more attuned to the you know societal I suppose the social model and that it's not just on me and I'm and I'm wondering how how that is reflected or not in in speech therapy it's certainly taken on in speech therapy. It's certainly, you know, it's, it, it, it's regarded as whatever your, whatever your problem is, we should be listening to it. We should be able to, to take on what you're saying and, and get the meaning of it and understand the meaning of it and then look at, well, what if, the what if. I mean, that's where I'd go <clears throat> at, this, at this level. It sounds very superficial, I know. I, I, I honestly would find that a hard one to to manage that context where you're still going to get negative reactions well I, all all i think we part of part of what we need to do is to keep educating people you know that that it's nothing wrong with stuttering there's nothing wrong with disfluency we all do it here here margaret Okay. Brilliant, Margaret. Sure. Thanks. Um, can we go to Amy next? Though? I think Amy has had a hand up as well. So. Hello, Amy. Hi, Margaret. It's good to see you. Um, thank you for a very interesting talk. Um, something that resonated with me um, was when you said that therapy is both a science and an art. And something that I've been thinking about recently is that, in a way, I feel as a discipline, we're forgetting about that art element, that we're very focused on things like evidence-based practice, which is very positive. We want that rigor. However, I feel that the research and also our education of speech and language therapists is neglecting the that, I suppose, the artistic element, the things like therapeutic alliance and the more human side of therapy. Um, and I wonder, would you agree or maybe disagree with that and, and how you've, I suppose, seen, seen it evolve over the years? OK, big, big question. Uh, I, um, I, I think that therapists have to be creative. I mean, you, can, you cannot but be creative if you're a therapist. You really cannot manage without that creativity and uh, looking at ideas about how, how, to, how to facilitate what's going on there, who, well, what's the best way to, to problem solve? What's the best way to look at even, even listening, how, how to listen better? 
uh, and and there are those aspects of uh, of creativity, I think, in certainly in managing uh, uh, in working with children. You, you you've just got to be creative because they're creative. And I, I would say most therapists develop that creativity when they're when they're in practice. Um, I, not only speech and language therapists, but I would say that that um, occupational therapists are very creative. Also, I mean, really creative. Not only practical, but they, they, but the, you know, problem solving. Some some of the creativity that goes on there is is quite extraordinary. Um, Education is is a very a very large. Uh, I, one graduate recently told me that you know in, in Trinity College so many things were thrown at them, and that's what it felt like that they have had to cover so much, and that every lecture was lecturing on a different topic, and. And you had to you had to cover each each element, and you had to be expert, or at least develop an expertise in each area in order to get through the course. And that it felt at times when there was that there was no time for anything else. And somebody has said to me recently to cover the um, to cover the course in two years as a post grad that you don't have a moment to sit and think. You just have to get it all together, and. And you see, I think if we don't work with the science, we're no good. And I think that as therapists, we come with a certain amount of creative attitude, at least, to find different means of, of interacting, to find different ways of, of of understanding what's going on. And, you know, one of the important parts of therapy would, for example, be the development of humor uh, with, within that interaction. And um, again, I would say that, you know, the, the, the use of humor, I mean, that's also looked at in, 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 in therapy and it, it does, it does facilitate again some understanding of what's of how of how to manage things better. Um, I can't think what else to say right now, Amy. That's it's, perfect, it's, Margaret. And it's I do Friday, agree. It's Friday it's, evening. It's, yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly. But it's interesting. I just, yeah, I was going to say some. Sorry. In terms of the scope of practice of speech and language therapy, it's ever expanding, isn't it? So there's certain yeah. topics that unfortunately get neglected more than others. And I feel For like sure. stuttering has been one of those. Yeah, maybe. Maybe, but um, the ECSF, you know, hmm. uh, for specialists and to develop specialisms in stuttering, is is fully subscribed to every year. I guess I mean for so the, the undergraduates. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. And the point would be, I, I think, uh, you know, if you look at, if you look at other areas for children, I mean, uh, you know, the vast majority of children grow out of stuttering if they're stuttering, and that's a good reason to say, well, let's move on and work with other mm -hmm. with other you know, more um, debilitating, if you like, problems such as perhaps significant left palate or, um, you know, significant language disorder or, yeah. you know, do you know what I mean? That some of yeah. them may, may be more, um, may be more, what's the word? Uh, debilitating is not the right word, but you do you know what I mean? Yeah, so, no, I know, I, I, yeah. yeah. It's like they're perceived as, as more, more urgent, more urgent, perhaps. Yeah. yeah. Um, but but as, as I said, there's always a few in every year who want to work at stuttering. Every year there were always two, three, four, five people who wanted to work at stuttering. And, 
you know, if for no other reason, you know, that would make me more passionate about at least encouraging those two, three, four, five groups. Um, because again, it's a it's a fascinating area. It's a whole it's a whole uh, it's a whole area really that incorporates a lot of other kinds of um, um, expertises, including psychology, including sociology, including a whole range of things. So yeah. yeah. Thank you, Margaret. Brilliant, Amy. Thanks. You're so welcome. Much. Um, Francis, I think Francis. Yes, please. Yes, um, uh, I was uh, I was going to ask Margaret. She she talked about uh, f f facilitating expression, and I was wondering um, how would she recommend that for adults who stammer? Facilitating expression, right? Oh yes. Okay. Grand. Um, Well, when, when we're looking at communication overall, we're looking at function, content, and use. So I would look at use of expression in that instance and look at where the person wants to... <coughs> excuse me. Excuse me, sir. Uh, uh, perhaps look, look, look at where the person wants to develop, you know, the context again, as um, as Nora was talking about in particular contexts, where the person wants to develop different kinds of of um, expressing themselves or expression. Um, I, I do know when I was working with adults who stuttered that they they uh, a grand number of them, a large number of them went to um, courses for, for speaking in public. I can't remember what it's called. What's that called, Stephen? Oh, Toastmasters. Uh, yeah, Toastmasters. Toastmasters. Yeah. Toastmasters yeah. Yes. Yeah, so nice. there, there, there's a means of looking at developing expression. Right. Yeah. And, and this, well, it's, that, it's just it's that idea of finding, finding ways ar around about it. Um, I, um, I was wondering if you were uh, thinking about acting, you know, what would be good for developing self-expression, acting courses, we'll say. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm sure, yeah. Um, Jonathan does some work with children with acting. Uh, Jonathan and some others were working with uh, Ashling, I believe. And yeah. Ashling and Callum, I think. Callum as well. Okay. Um, use use acting, yeah. In I I say it, is it? I say it. Uh, yeah. They have courses yeah. for children. Um, yeah. Yes, the, the the fact is, Francis, that if you're acting in, in in general, if you're acting, you don't stutter, which is which is um, which is an interesting uh, aspect of it. But um, that's probably because you're not being yourself. However, we act all the time. We are acting all the time. We're in a particular role and we switch that role and so on. We're acting all of the time. So I, I, um, uh, I, I have never, well, I know some therapists actually who worked in stuttering who were actors. And they came to working in stuttering through acting. Yeah, Peggy Dalton was one. Um, yeah, there are two or three others. Uh, names aren't just coming to me now because I'm, to, I'm, I'm uh, my excuse is it's Friday evening. <laughs> and I, I'm over 25. Thank you, anyway. Sorry. I'll Thank think you. more about it. I'll think more yeah. about it. Okay. Um. So does anybody else have any questions? Because uh, I don't want to keep you for too, 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 too much longer, Margaret. Anyway. Can I have a quick oh. question, Stephen, yeah. please? This yeah. is Mary. So, Margaret, you, you touched there about the idea of gener you know, generalists, all therapists versus specialists, right? And yeah. um, I suppose it's something that does come up when you work in speech therapy uh, is... There definitely is a lot of children who start to stutter maybe at some stage and won't go on to to stutter for very long okay um but then there is the whole cohort of people 
who do go on to stutter and stutter as older children, teenagers, young adults. And just wondering what your thoughts are around whether or not maybe all therapists can deal with it up to a certain point, but that it's better then to have people who have taken the time to uh, to study a bit more deeply because it is changing. And I hear the therapists I work with talk around how generally the role of therapists, you know, you talked about change. And as you were talking about it, I was thinking more and more now I hear therapists I work with say their role is changing, that so much time when they're moving towards neuroaffirmative practices, neurodiversity affirming practices, they find that their role is more around um, education and understanding and building the right to be who you are and confidence and uh, being able to explain and self-advocate and self-disclose. And um, so, yeah, I just wonder what you think about like whether or not we do need a specialist um, in stuttering and in, in other areas maybe do, but just, or whether as a, as a whole, the discipline is going to move. Um, like it's, it's a developmental language disorder again, you know, it, it, it's in every area and therapists are saying our roles are changing and we're kind of needing to look at how do we, how do we um, help people to change? And now is that change more to do with how you understand yourself and how you, and the realization I don't need to fit in. I just need to learn how to self-disclose and self-advocate. It's a long question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, there's a range, a range of, of uh, different issues there, Mary. I, I um, I've always found it difficult when I hear a therapist say, I know nothing about stuttering. And they come out of college, you know, four years, hard work and I have spent a lot of time <laughs> telling them about studying and they come out and they say I know nothing about it and I'm thinking well actually you do. I believe that generalists should all be able to effectively and efficiently make thorough assessments about the differences between those children who are going to stutter and those children who are not. We have that information. We have a lot of it. We don't have it all, but we have a lot of that information. And we, every single therapist should be able to provide that information to parents, every single one. And um, I, I, I I just don't understand how anybody can say I know nothing about it after four years of learning about it. But I do understand that there's so much to learn and that, that it goes down and they, they focus on three main or four main or five main areas. And they know that they're going to get their experience in X and Y and not A, B and C or whatever it happens to be. And uh, yeah. I think specialisms in stuttering though are, are important, but I think a generalist should be able to do a thorough assessment and provide strong, detailed information to parents and to adults, strong and detailed. And you know, if they're not able to do that, I have a blue space in, in, in some of the education practices, I'm afraid. But that's just the way it is. That's just the way it is. I, I don't. Uh, I don't know. I think. I think. I think the point is that perhaps you need to specialize afterwards. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, if it's okay, we can just go to Cynthia now. Just has our hand raised there, Margaret. If that's okay. Sure. Yeah, well, thank you very much for the presentation and Stephen for organizing this event. Uh, yeah, I was thinking about uh, the specialists and uh, the generalized uh, or generalist uh, therapy. And uh, yeah, I think in my own experience, I had to like learn after my undergraduate. Um, yeah, so after school, I, I needed to learn a lot about the summary and I learned a lot after uh, yeah, my graduation. Uh, I think I had the information, but not that perspective that I have 
right now. So the information, I mean, the, the science behind stuttering or stammering, but not about the art or um, about this new perspective about stammering pride and those kind of things that I learned afterwards. And uh, yeah, I, I believe that uh, it's not only my case. I believe it's uh, uh, maybe some other speech therapists, uh, maybe from even from South America or North America. Well, I'm from South America and I had that experience. And uh, yeah, it's like tricky because uh, you uh, finish the uh, finish the school the, the university and then uh, I think I knew about it but then it was not enough or I I faced some challenging situations uh and uh, yeah I had to learn a lot from different training courses and yeah it's very challenging now now it's uh, like there are a lot of approaches like uh, act and cbt and uh, solution focus and so many things uh that we can um uh use or learn uh, to uh, support or to join the path of people who stammer but uh yeah my personal experience is that oh i had to learn a lot through the process and uh, and i think some information uh don't come so quickly to south america and yeah there's a need to to learn in Engl in english those kind of things uh so yeah it's 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 a, a challenging path for so many speech therapists uh, from uh, South America, Latin America, and yeah, and uh, yeah. Well, it's my my experience, but well, thank you for 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 sharing. And uh, yeah, I believe it's different from yeah. Th there's a different experience maybe for speech therapists from the UK or from the USA. Yeah, but. Uh, I know Fernanda is from Argentina and yes, yes she's just like nothing. <laughs> yeah, because okay. yeah, she shares the, the same experience. But thank you very much for sharing what's very interesting, everything. Okay, thank you indeed. Um, your English is excellent. So um, yeah, it's it's uh, we do work with some people from South America in the in the ECSF or the what's become the ESS. Um, Okay, now it's we're nearly coming up to half eight, so uh, oh we're gosh, in this tenor, so oh, um, so yeah, can I for... can I just thank uh, Margaret uh, just from everyone here at the RSA? Uh, I would really like to thank you for giving up that time to actually come and to, to, to talk with us here. Big pleasure, big um, pleasure. If, thank you, thank you for asking me. Sorry, um, if it's okay, if we can just take a picture also, Margaret, uh, if you don't mind that, we can just put up on the website. Uh, sorry, uh, Penny, Penny just has a hand up for us as well there. Sorry, Penny. <coughs> oh, sorry, I was actually just doing the clapping emoji to say thank you to Mark. Oh, oh, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> I was just going, man. Okay, so... Um, <laughs> Okay, so if everyone, um, I will just take a picture now, uh, like three, so we all, give us a lovely smile anyway, okay? One, two, three. Cool. Then that's great. Uh, so yeah, look, Margaret, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very, very much uh, for joining us. And, um, hopefully we will Thanks, see Stephen. you. Um, hopefully we, we will see you at some future uh, meetings. Absolutely, absolutely, and and thank thank you, Stephen, for helping me so much getting getting this far. Okay. <laughs> it's been a, it's a really it's been a, it's been a pleasure. Thank you. Okay, brilliant. Okay, everyone, thanks a lot. Yes. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye. bye 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 bye. Stephen.